Good afternoon. I'm Lucas Panzica from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. Blockbuster trade in the NFL this morning as the Houston Texans acquired four-time Pro Bowl wide receiver Stephon Diggs in a trade with the Bills. Buffalo receiving a 2025 second-round pick via Minnesota. Houston receives Diggs and a 2024 sixth-round pick as well as a 2025 fifth rounder yesterday the titans officially introduced a player that likely will be matched up with Diggs this season in former chiefs cornerback legerius sneed titans general manager Rand carthon spoke after sneed on tuesday and said there is still time to address the front end of the defense after all the moves the titans made on the back end at corner from a free agency standpoint free agency is open it's not over so we're going to continue to look, and then obviously we got the draft, which is taking our focus now. Uh, so we're going to continue to look to add, you know, up front um, on, on all sides of the ball. Um, but it, we're, we're still working on that. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Let's go. It's hump day on Blaine and Mickey. What's up, everybody? I bet they're partying in Houston, Texas right now. They just add everybody. Have you if you got any eligibility left, you've probably been signing the Texans if you, you don't even know it. No, nah, no. Are you on the Texans they, now? They, they know. Finish your career in H Town where you started it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they yeah, that didn't happen. I was a little disappointed. Boy, no. they are, man, they are putting a crew <laughs> together. Oh my, they have to be the favorites. They they going after they going for it with with their rookie quarterback. There's no doubt about it. I mean they got weapons. I mean people forget they have a mixing too. Yeah. They run it back and yeah. Pierce. They run it back and then let's go through the gauntlet. I, I I can name probably six of their receivers. Tank Dell. Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, who else got Robert Woods? Nico Collins, Collins, who had kid. a great year last year. Um, uh, Michi. People forget. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Alabama. And he was really good. And he had a little, you know, serious issue there uh, with sickness. And um, and so, uh, yeah. And so uh, he'll be in rare form and hungry, let alone the tight end. Uh, what's it? The tight end? Uh, Schultz? Dalton Schultz. Dalton yeah. Schultz. Got a three-year deal himself. Schultz, uh, man. And, uh, you know, we all know. Now they got digs. Here are the list of acquisitions the, the Texans have made so far this offseason. Stefan Diggs via trade, Daniil Hunter, Joe Mixon, Danico Autry, Jeff Okuda, CJ Henderson, Tim Settle, Foley Fatukazi, and Tommy Townsend. Dang. And Aziz. Yeah, they still they forgot Aziz players. on there. <laughs> I mean Yeah, that's this uh yeah, they yeah, they uh they are about to make it happen. Like they are shoof, this is the time though when you're you know, gotta Great rookie quarterback, uh, and now you can spend all that money to make sure you got the pieces in place, had some experience. It was his rookie year. And, uh, yeah, so they got to be the odds-on favorite, uh, not only win the AFC South. I'm interested to see whether they are in the AFC. You got the Ravens. You got the Chiefs, of course. And then Bills, Texans, if I'm guessing, top five. They got to be in the top five. Uh, I think Mickey looked not at, on air, so I don't know what you. Well, I think he he had uh, showed me his their <laughs> John Super Glennon odds. tweeted their yeah. odds. Oh, and how much they changed, and it was shocking because we've had this discussion a million times with each other with Todd Furman. He's like, one guy doesn't make that much of a difference unless it's a quarterback. Uh, this is from Bet Online. This is John Glennon just a few minutes ago. The Texans' odds of winning the Super Bowl went from twenty-two to one to ten to one. After the Diggs trade, third best in the NFL. So it's Chiefs, 49ers, Ravens, and Texans tied. So they're 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 the fourth best team is basically what that's saying. Yeah, oh, what I said well, I said in the AFC. So yeah, they're talking about overall, huh? Yep. Oh. But what's terrifying that's got them is third third in the AFC behind the Chiefs. The teams I just said, the Ravens the and Ravens. the Potters. In the AFC. Uh, of uh, this is the current bet online odds to win the Super Bowl: Chiefs in the AFC, 49ers NFC, then Ravens, Texans, Bengals, all AFC. So if you're the Titans, you're just trying to win your division, but you're also trying to beat all these other knuckleheads. Just to the AFC is loaded right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is you know, 
I'm going to say this rebuilding. You can't uh, get everything done in one year, but uh, the Titans are going to be very competitive. I I, I'm, I believe that. Uh, I like the direction they're going, and uh, so uh, yeah, maybe maybe they got a little. Maybe they got nervous when they signed us signed Sneed mm-hmm. because uh, Diggs. Uh, I don't think he did so well versus uh, Sneed. <laughs> I think he had like forty yards, maybe. I think uh, last year in two games. I don't think he had a single catch recorded against Snead as the primary defender. Mm-hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah, that seems good against the against the Chiefs. Oh yeah, when they in the two games against the Chiefs, so that includes the uh, the playoff game uh, and their regular season game. Mm-hmm. I think he had five targets um, between the two games, uh, and I don't think he had a single catch when uh, Snead was the primary defender on Diggs. Right. See how you said that primary. So what that tells me is Diggs is still an elite receiver. He's had five, six, I don't know how many thousand yard receiving games. If you don't have another target opposite of you, you can double Diggs, take him out of the game, whether it's Snead or Diggs, or, you know, however you want to do it until at least when he was with the Bills. And then you say other guys beat me. That's what it sounds like to me when I hear the stats. A lot of people read the stats and say, oh, Diggs is not the player he was. Because, see, the stats say so. But you got to go watch the game and see how they were trying to take if Diggs was the guy. So, yeah, that's what happens when you only have one threat. Well, the Texans have multiple threats now. So it's going to be really, really, really interesting. Uh, Boy. That just told me uh, the Titans got to they got to get the tackle and they got to get a pass pass rusher. rusher. That's mm-hmm. yeah, that, that that's one two pass rush. Yeah, yeah, that, that one two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got. <laughs> I I still think, I still think you go tackle at seven, pass rusher at thirty eight. Like oh okay, I thought you were gonna say wide receiver. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no, yeah. Pa- yeah I'm, pass- I'm with you. Whatever order yeah. you want to do it too. By the way, I'm hoping they get the trade back. I saw some different scenarios on on X, but. Yeah, I'm hoping they get to get three picks like within the first two rounds, and maybe they even get to get a receiver. That'd be mm-hmm. cool too, or another D tackle. You know, D tackle and a D in with the offensive tackle by moving back. Maybe you don't get alt, but you do get a really good player at tackle. I'm probably gonna jump right in that room with yeah, you. I, hope man, for I all hope that. that that happens. If not, boy, oof, I don't know. Yeah, that, that was pretty cool. Hey, hey, uh, we forgot to. I mean, I saw this all over Twitter about, you know, how many people watched the uh, women's uh, basketball game and Caitlin Clark and crew. It was the most ever in uh, their history, I think, 12-something million dollars. 12.3 million. I mean, a million people. Yeah. I said dollars, yeah. <laughs> viewers, it is all about the dollars. 12.3 it's million about dollars. dollars. Yeah, because I was, guess what? I was all tuned in and all over that game, by the way. We didn't even mention it yesterday, so we got to do that, especially for women's sports, because that's why everybody was watching uh, super duper talent, but I had text Mickey uh, yesterday, uh, you know, earlier, and uh, like, where do you put Caitlin Clark on the the list of greatest players in co- women's college basketball? You know, I mean, you got Candace Park. I mean, there's a numerous list swoops. I can you can go all the way back to Ma Moore. I mean, you can go down the list. Cheryl Miller. Cheryl Miller. I mean, we can go way back. But uh, man, I don't know if she wins a Natty. I, I may put her number one. And here's why I say that. Because this is what I was asking from Dalton Connect. See how she dribbles and then sets up her teammates? Think about Connect. He never does that. He's just a pure score and shooter. But then that way you set your guys up, and then now they also become impactful players too. Uh, even though she put up 40, there was, I mean, there was time she could have kept shooting, but she didn't. She set her guy, you know, ladies up and then got them great shots, whether it was layups or good open mid-range to three-point shots. Mm-hmm. So that was the next layer to me to push connect to take Tennessee to the next level. And that's what you ask of elite players. Not to say that he wasn't elite, but that's how you do it. And man, I I have tons of respect for her. And uh, man, I, I don't know, just because she has the three-point line, I may put her at the top. Even without the natty, I I don't know. Like when you go back and look, you know, watch uh, Mile Moore, can most of those are mid range. They're not shooting a three ball like that. It, it, it what didn't exist sometimes. Uh, and you know, if we go back to Cheryl Miller and Swoops and all those, you know, I'm missing a whole bunch of people. But 
I think I think she's man. The way she was shooting that thing, I, I was kind of comparing her while I was watching her to like Steph Curry type. She do, shoots from his range sometimes. Yeah. Do you take yeah. into account like the number of like national championships and stuff won, uh, or, or is that more of a team thing? For, for you. I don't know. That's why I said if she be, gets a natty, I think she will be number one. I know people going to smash me with that. Please call in, you know, 737-1045. But, man, I the way she was shooting that ball and was so focused and how she was setting up her teammates throughout that time, man, they were running and gunning and they were beating LSU up the floor for layups. It was ridiculous. They were, they were pumped up for this one. They were like, y'all got us last year, this year, no can do. And, oh, man, did you see the girl who looks exactly like her that was in the, in the stands and it – I, I retweeted it. Yeah, she looks exactly like her, and she had on her jersey, and the people thought that was her. Looks exact. I mean, it looked like they were twins. Okay. Yeah, yeah. On the uh, on the X. I'm, I'm gonna go back. Yeah. Wow. Well, Speaking <laughs> of uh, women's basketball, like, don't see Angel Reese declared for the WNBA draft today. Oh yeah, I think that was on the TV when right we here. came in. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, man. Whew. Can I She's can I show you what I wrote about that? Mama Jamma. After you sent me wow. that. I understand why Danny White did it. Look at the Elite Eight games. South Carolina, LSU, future SEC, Faux Texas, all there. UConn still up there. Iowa and Caitlin Clark literally in a different hemisphere. 12.3 million saw Iowa's victory over LSU, making it the most watched women's college basketball game on record. So many eyes on the games and your team not there and not looking like it has the path to get there. Yeah, right. To get to that elite level yeah. like that. They, they're, they're just not. Yeah, UT. That's why the move was made. I mean, she was solid. Is she elite as like, a coach, Harper? I, I saw somebody, like, comparing, like, Rick Barnes' first five years at Tennessee to Kelly Harper's first five years at Tennessee, and Kelly Harper's resume looked a lot better, more Sweet 16s, more NCAA tournament appearances. And everyone's like, why aren't we holding – why didn't we hold Rick Barnes the same standard? It's because it's not the same standard. Lady Vols basketball mm. and Tennessee men's basketball, not the same standard at all. Eight national championships for Lady Vols. You got to have higher higher expectations than a couple Sweet 16s in, in five years. Mm. Well said. Somebody was having this debate the other day, and and it was like something on ESPN. I was walking by the TV. One of those people brought up Brianna Stewart, just mm -hmm. because she won four national championships. Yeah, she was Rebecca most, Lobo. I mean, we could talk about most outstanding player four times, three time consensus player of the year. She was fantastic. Rebecca Lobo. I, people don't remember her because she didn't play long in the NBA. I know, but she was phenomenal in college. Ooh. Go look it up, people. You'd be astounded at what she did. Now, those are bigs. Yeah. And, and Clark's not a big. She is shooting. She handles the rock. She is shooting three-pointers from the timeline. Uh, it's just. I mean, she was two or three steps behind it sometime and then leaning and just shooting that thing, man. And I mean, oh, my. I, she, whoo, I don't know, man. I, Plus her ability to just pass the ball, too. Pa like, her I, passing, I, her dribbling, just her whole skill. I mean, I, I, I think. And I think she, I, I, we could kind of go back and you can convince me probably somebody else, but I, I don't want to be in the moment type guy, but wow, she was impressive, man. And has done it consistently game in and game out over and over again, even in the bright light. So I'm, I'm going to give her, if she wins the natty, I, I'm going to say she's number one. I, I think she's in competition with, you know, a whole bunch of other ladies, but she gets that. I'm like, so, nah, she's, in she's her the top career, of the mountaintop. In her career in Iowa. Guard. Yeah. She averages 29, 8, and 7. She can do the thing where her feet aren't even really set. That's what I'm saying. And she can still shoot it from 10 feet behind. I, I like. It looks like there's a magnet on the ball that leads it to the basket sometimes. I feel like she's unstoppable. When she's in rhythm, just a matter if she just didn't hit off, she still would have had 25. Yeah. <laughs> it was, <laughs> Hey, I don't know. We would have uh, to put bananas out there and see if she could snip, up, you know, slip on a banana peel out there. I don't think she would. I, I think would not bananas be able would to get her. taken to school. Would, right. either. Justin Mello is going to join us next. Me we'll either. talk draft picks. Let's take these couple of calls real quick, guys. Kevin and then Rick. What's up, Kevin? What do you think about all this? So, I think the best player in college history and in, in women's is Brianna Stewart. You just hit that. You just said that. But four-time champion. She was four-time tournament uh, MVP. She won, I, th I think her record, I looked it up the other day, was like 151 wins, five losses in her career, four-time champion. I don't know how you can have a better college career. And when you're saying 
who's the best college player of all time. Mm-hmm. Four-time champion, four-time player of the year. Uh, or um, MVP, I mean, um, tournament MVP. And, like, what was her averages, wins. though? I, I don't know. And she goes on to win Rookie of the Year in the WNBA, two-time MVP in the NBA, two-time champion in the WNBA. I don't know how she's not the best player of all mm, time. Good point. My okay. favorite player of all time is saying it's Rossi. But mm. So the championships I, I matter for you, best right? Best player of all time. I don't know how Caitlin Clark, she's, what, a junior? She hasn't even played four years. I don't think that. Mm. She is better. No, she's played as four an years. Overall player than Brianna Stewart. Brianna Stewart wins the game for them every year. Yeah. Okay, Kevin. Good point. Uh, so uh, Brianna Stewart averaged seventeen point six points per game, three assists, <laughs> and eight rebounds. Okay. Yeah, and probably a way better supporting cast around her. Oh yeah, you kind mm-hmm. bunch of five yeah. stars. See. Uh, Rick and Franklin. Hey, real quick, buddy, because we got to hit the commercial, but uh, certainly want to hear what you got, buddy. All right, real quick. Uh, here's the commercial that we should see on TV. It should be uh, clips of uh, Seth shooting, Caitlin shooting, Steph shooting, all of the floor. And the last line is, yep, you're right. Seth Curry shoots like a girl. <laughs> Rick. Oh, well, I wasn't saying that. I was comparing her actually to Curry. Yeah, that's what uh, he's doing. Yeah, he's yeah. saying that. He's, you should compare Curry to, to her because yeah, right. she's so yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I mean, yeah, and I get the argument of championships and all that, but as an individual talent, I don't know, man. And she's, wow, she's, wow, man. And we can go down. I mean, he just, yeah, wow, Tarasi, Parker, Miller, Moore, Swoops, Stewart, Clark. I mean, she's in that conversation. I'm so, not, I, I, I know everybody puts championships with it, but that's always up to debate to different scenarios with elite players. I mean, you know, I'm a Michael Jordan guy. He's got more championships than anybody. Uh, but LeBron James has eclipsed him and, and is not even a potent scorer and is the leading scorer in the NBA history, right? So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> how do you stack them up? Like, okay, who was better? Oh, because they won championships? Okay. That doesn't mean you were better. At everything, you know, if you had to go one-on-one in different eras. Tough call, though. It's fun debate, though, because yeah, you talk about so many great players, and people need to go back and find some distinguished gentlemen in the FNM bank chat said Cheryl Miller, it, the best. It's, it's not even close. Yeah. I, I would just challenge people, like, go find some YouTube videos, and people say, who is that? It's Reggie's sister. Yeah. Actually, she— His older sister. Yes. He he was Cheryl Miller's brother. Yes. She was that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if Justin Mello has brothers or sisters, but he knows the draft, and he will join us to talk about it next on Blaine and Mickey, powered by all four seasons, Garage Doors. Summer's right around the corner, right? And we are releasing a limited number of lake lots to the public. It's a one-day-only deal. You remember this. Saturday, April 20th, experience resort lake living at a fraction of the cost. Uh, Two-acre wooded lots from $79.9 and lake cottage packages with a boat slip from $349.9 and lake lots with a boat slip from $64.9 private golf cart access to a new marina and they got walking trails and shoreline that you can walk in a huge clubhouse and they have waterfront concerts you can put your boat just a golf cart a, a ride away from yourself so you can jump in at any time with pickleball pools on-site coffee shop it's all there you can play on the lake or just relax at the waterfront restaurant all 20 minutes from knoxville financing is available so why not call secure a private appointment today times are limited to enjoy this life on the water and sunshine and boat rides the lake life and memories you've been dreaming of limited property release saturday april 20th visit us now lakelivingtn.com or better yet call and make that appointment 865-408-9992 memories start here below msrp Below MSRP. Below MSRP. It's pretty simple. Two River Sports sells all new non-specialty Fords below MSRP.
Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. Miller, the best ever. Talking some basketball, talking some draft, we're talking it all. Justin Mello joins us now. Uh, draft Network and Titans MCM and Broadway TN. He's so busy. He just works for everybody, and he is at Justin M underscore NFL. You can follow him there. Oh, uh, we got him here. Justin, who is your Titans must have at seven if he is available? Who's your dream scenario for the Titans at seven? Well, I'm going to be a little bit boring here and, and, and stick with the guy that you've seen mocked time and time again. It's Joe Alt, the left tackle from Notre Dame. I know everyone's thinking about the receivers, Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, and I wouldn't rule that out. In fact, I hope all three of them are available on draft night just to see what Callahan would do, see if he can help himself uh, with drafting a receiver. Uh, as as he's very publicly said, um, he is prone to doing. But you look at this depth chart at tackle, did you guys realize, I noticed this the other day, they've only got three on the 90-man roster right now. That's pretty crazy. And the three of them are, by the way, Nicholas petit uh John Ajoku, and, uh, and Jalen Duncan. Those are the three tackles on the roster. Now, they, they've called Dylan Raiden to guard publicly this offseason. You know, no. Sadiq Charles, who they signed away from the commanders, has played more and has been better at guard. So three tackles on the roster. None of those guys are starting caliber players. I don't care who the hell the offensive line coach is. They've got to add some talent uh, to that room. It, it, it's kind of surprising to me they haven't done it in free agency yet. Um, it's really setting them up to, 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 to kind of zero in on a tackle at number seven. I know you never want to be in that position. Ideally, you want to be able to go sort of marry best player available with the need. But they've got such a huge need at left tackle. Um, I, I don't see how they can I exit the first round without taking a player like Joe Alt. What are the differences that you have between Alt and Fashion New? How do you have them scouted maybe the same and differently? Well, I, I think one thing is they're both very good athletes. I think there's no questioning that. You could look at the combine and you could line that up yourself. I will say I, I think Fashion U is a better athlete overall than Alt. He's a better mover in space. I think he thrives a bit more on an island in some of those one-on-one -on -one pass pro situations due to his easy athletic ability. Mm -hmm. I think Joe Alt is a significantly better run blocker at this point than Fashion U is. I, again, I think Fashion U is kind of tailor-made for a pass-happy NFL offense as a pass protector. And that might line up with the vision the Titans have. I don't think it's a coincidence they went out and signed Lloyd Cushenberry, one of the best pass pro centers in the league. And, of course, Coach Callahan, you know, overseeing or helping oversee a pass-happy offense in Cincinnati. There's no doubt this team wants to pass the ball more. So that, that's an interesting note on Fashion New. Mm -hmm. But I think Joe Walt is the better run blocker and is a much more technically advanced player at this point in time. Fashion New struggles with run blocks. I find he struggles to sort of sustain throughout the uh, completion of a play and uh, hand placement, pad level, things of that nature, I think are still a work in progress. Whereas Joe Walt already looks like, to me, like a five- or six-year seasoned pro. This guy was born to play offensive tackle. I mean, his dad was a first-round pick. Uh, in the 80s at that position. So uh, for me, that's one of the major differences. I think Joe Alt is a, a more finished product from a technical perspective. Hanging out with our guy Justin Mello at Justin M underscore NFL talking all things draft. Well, Justin, uh, I guess if the Titans trade back, how far back do you think they can go, let's say 11, 12, whoever it may be, to still get a, fat, let's say, fashion -o? Well, it depends Let's who you're Alt trading. Alt is gone. Alt is gone. So, and, and then someone offers them a trade, and if they decide to still go with a tackle. Well, it depends who you're trading back with. Like, for example, uh, the New Orleans Saints, who I believe are at 14. Okay. You know, that's a team I could see having interest in trading up. The problem with that, to answer your question, is I think they'd be targeting a tackle like Fashion New, right? Like, oh. they, you know, left, left tackle is a big question there now. With, uh, I mean, number one, Trevor Penning hasn't worked out for them. And now you've got the situation with Ryan Ramzik, uh, who, who's, uh, you know, potentially a career ending knee injury. There's some issues there that they're sorting through. So uh, I don't know that you could still get him 
if you were to trade back with the Saints at mm. 14, but I, if you're if, if he's the goal, I look at the New York Jets at 10. You know, if they want to come up for a receiver, the the Broncos and Vikings and, Broncos and Raiders and Vikings, really and Raiders at ele- I think 11, 12, 13. They're all in a row. Uh-huh. One of them might you know they're not going to take a tackle to our knowledge. So if they come up for a quarterback, I think you could still trade back with one of those teams and get fashion. You know, the key to that again, I think, would be staying in front of the New Orleans Saints. Now, mind you. You asked about fashion news specifically. There are a ton of tackles in this class, right? If they want to trade back with the Saints at 14 and say, hey, you go get fashion new, we really like uh, J.C. Latham from Alabama. We really like Talais Fuaga from Oregon State. We really like Amarius Mims from Georgia. So there are so many, Troy Fatanu from Washington. There are so many tackles in this class that project as potential top 20 picks. Uh, they could trade back with really, I think, any of those teams I just mentioned mm. and still get a first-round tackle. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that was good to hear then. I know it's a deep tackle, let's say, draft, at least in the early round, first or second round, but kind of break down uh, Latham's uh, play as well compared to those top two that we've already talked about. Well, Latham is a ginormous man, right? He is a, he's bigger than both of them, like, you know, 6'8", 340, whatever he is. Uh, I, I'll say, and I don't say this lightly. I love this tackle class, and this is a very specific thing, but there isn't a prospect that has better grip strength in this class than J.C. <laughs> okay. Latham. He is very much oh. a mauler, a road grader at right tackle. He is a dominant, dominant uh, mauling right tackle in the, in the run game. Uh, there are some questions about the foot speed, right, and whether he could survive on an island. Now, mind you, those questions were, were sort of brought to the forefront or further brought to the forefront, I should say, by the fact that he didn't test throughout this process, right? What does he know, right? What does his agent know? Those decisions aren't mm. made lightly, right? So we didn't get those testing numbers. That's unfortunate. That's where some of the questions arise with him. I also think he is a right tackle through and through. Now, I think the Titans have holes at both positions right now, left and right. So there are different ways to skin a cat, as they say. So there are different ways they can attack that, those positions. It doesn't have to necessarily be a left tackle in the first round. They could go with a guy like Latham at right tackle and solve that position. But I don't think there's a prospect in this tackle class that has better grip strength than he does. That means holding, right? Justin Mello uh, with <laughs> at the Draft Network, I guess. Give me three players on your board now that everything's kind of settled down, that somebody is moving into the first round, someone's moving to the second round, and, and a middle round player that you really like that people are kind of somewhat overlooking or, or not talking about, let's just say us from the media side of it, uh, that uh, is really going to have an impact on, on some teams. Well, offensive tackle, sticking with that theme, there's one at Washington, Roger Rosengarden, the right tackle for them, uh, who played opposite Troy Fatanu, who projects as a first-round pick, the left tackle. Uh, Roger Rosengarden went to the combine and ran the best 40 out of anyone there, 492. I mean, that's an electric time for like a 310-pound offensive tackle. Uh, he projects in, into that sort of Callahan-like system, that zone-blocking scheme. Uh, a lot of teams are running nowadays, right? Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay had sort of uh, made it popular again, right, after the John Grudens and the Callahans and, 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 and Father Shanahan, if you will, uh, brought it to the forefront throughout the early mid nineties, but uh, Roger Rosengarden's one. I think he's got a chance to sneak into the, the back end of the first round. Mm. You look at uh, teams like the Chiefs and 49ers, those last two picks of night one, both of them need tackles as things stand. I think San Francisco could do better on the right side. Chiefs can do better on the left. So that's the guy that sticks out to me. Tight end from Kansas state. Ben Sinat is another one. I don't think enough people are talking about electric testing up the combine. In fact, uh, I'd wager to say, and I haven't seen this enough, I think he's going to be the second tight end drafted. Now, I don't think that's going to happen on night one, of course. That's Brock Bowers. But once you get into that second round, a lot of people were thinking the Texas kid. Some people thought the Penn State kid, Theo Johnson, after he tested well. I think Ben Sinat's the most complete tight end, not named Brock Bowers in this class. And then one final one, I think that's picked up steam and has been throughout the whole process. Is Darius Robinson, the the, yeah. deep, the sort of D-tackle hybrid edge yeah, out of Missouri. Mm-hmm. I went into his tape in early January. I'm going to say this, okay? Sometimes I, I like to think you get good enough at this. You kind of know how something's going to go before you've even done the work, okay? Mm-hmm. I went into the process before I even turned the tape on, and I, I noticed a lot of people were low on him, okay? And I said, okay, what am I missing here? I'm curious to see what I'm missing, because the first thing I know is the guy had eight and a half sacks last year at Missouri in the SEC, He's got inside-outside versatility. He's got terrific length. 
he's a get off the bus kind of guy, right? Like mm. he's a very intimidating guy. If you see him in person, what am I missing here? And then I turned on the tape and said, wait, I'm not missing anything. Everyone else is sleeping on this guy. This guy is outstanding. Uh, then he goes, what happens? He goes to the senior bowl, dominates that. Uh, I thought it had a pretty good combine, depending on which position you, you view him as. But he strikes me as a guy, look, not a lot of bells and whistles, not overly explosive, not a lot of first-step twitchiness, but he's violent, he's physical, he's relentless. The motor's red hot. Titans need a body type like his, okay? He's available there at 38. Losing Dina Kowatri, a lot of similarities in their game. He's someone that could play, I think, on the edge, at, in base. You know, I'm looking at base early rundowns. He plays there, he stops the run. I think he's better suited to kick inside on pass rushing downs. But I, I would end that question with, with Darius Robinson, Roger Rosengarden, and Ben Sen at the tight end. Mm-hmm. At the Draft Network, Justin Mello. Uh, how do you have the big three receivers graded out? Uh, Harrison Jr., Neighbors, and Odunze as, like, as far as order? Can I just say I love all three of them? No, all yeah. kidding. I, I do love all of them. I really do, and I think they're very different. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., number one for me. That, I mean, that's been true for a, over a year now, it feels like. I'm not going to change. Don't, don't let prospect fatigue set in. I see a lot of people get bored this time of year and try to look for things that aren't there. Complete package. I, I don't have any issues with this game. It just is what it is. One of the best receiver prospects I think we've seen in the last 30, 40 years, really. He's, he's that good. He's up there. Uh, Malik Neighbors, I have slightly ahead of Roma Dunze at number two. Very different players, I think, which makes for a fun conversation. I love Malik's ability to win underneath the coverage. I think his best, uh, his best traits are uh, explosiveness, twitchiness, ability to separate from man coverage. Very hard to keep up with in and out of his breaks. He's just so smooth. And yard after catch ability is outstanding. In fact, if you head over to my Twitter account, I just did. A, we just did an all twenty-two breakdown of him on the YouTube channel. So you want to mm-hmm. sit down with me for all, close to an hour and watch this guy run routes as me and my co-host uh, Justin at Titans Film Room, Justin Graver. We break down the tape. We did that for over an hour. We couldn't mm-hmm. stop ourselves. We were so excited about him. Roma Dunze, a different player. I compare him, and it's interesting because there's the Callahan comparison here. I see him as a T. Higgins like playmaker. Okay, he's big. He's vertical. He's explosive. He's dominant at the catch point. Now, I have no concerns. You know, if you remember T. Higgins coming out, the question was the ability to consistently separate. He's checked that box, obviously. I expect Roma Dunze to do the same. I don't have those concerns. I think he wins in all three areas to where he's truly special is dominating the catch point. There's a, there's a ref against Texas from the, the college football playoff. Very late in the fourth quarter, he, it felt like at the time that he sealed the game on a deep ball from Michael Penix. Watch him flash the late hands. It's a thing of beauty. You probably might, you might remember the play I'm talking about, or you'll see it on Twitter. Like, there's a deep ball to him down the sideline. Corners in coverage, fairly tight. Nothing he can do. He doesn't even give the corner a chance to react. He flashes the hand so late. I'm talking a millisecond before the ball arrives. No chance for the corner to react to get his hands in there. This guy's a pro's pro. He's going to be an outstanding player at the next level. Going to make a lot of explosive plays in the passing game for somebody. Hanging out with Justin Mello at Justin M underscore NFL covering the draft. Well, Justin, uh, man, outside the box, I know a lot of people were speculating uh, about this player because they didn't play football. DJ Burns Jr. for NC State. What position would he project in the National <laughs> Football League? Would it be D in, tight end, offensive tackle, you know, uh, or is he, uh, he's probably just going to play an NBA cameraman for me of uh, Zach Randolph, maybe as a college player. But uh, what do you see there? Wow, Zach Randolph, that's a name I haven't heard in a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I, I think it was actually Jim Nagy, executive director of the Senior Bowl, who tweeted a couple of days ago that NFL teams would be legitimately interested in seeing him play left tackle or at least go through drills and practice as a tackle. I mean, big-bodied guy, he's light on his feet for his size, right? We're, we're heading into the final four here. Everyone's excited. Big-bodied guy, light on his feet. Uh, I, I think tackle, I mean, look, if that doesn't work, what do we always say this time of year with everyone? Kick him inside the guard if it doesn't work. Oh, man, when you're basketball, you inside a guard, that's a lot of physicality. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough one there. Now, another player I'm going to ask you about, and I don't even know if they're coming out. I haven't even checked, but I've watched him over the years. I know he has some injury issues there at Alabama, but he plays safety. Malachi Moore, is he coming out this year? To my knowledge, he is not. No, I okay. believe he returned to the he returned to the program. He'll be going back for another year. Uh, he is. This is not a very good safety class. So I'll say that oh, we could have used him in this class. Yes. You're not going to get a first round safety. Don't even think about it in this class. There are a couple guys I like on day two: Tyler Newbin from Minnesota, Jaden Hicks 
from Washington State. Javon Bullard from Georgia is a little undersized, but you really like the football IQ and the scrappiness. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this class could have used a healthy uh, Malachi Moore, but he's not a very good class right, otherwise. He got injured, yeah, because I know he was in front of Branch, who went to Detroit last year in the second round, who had a good year. Uh, I love that kid, too. That kid's a ball player. Yeah. Keon, uh, you know, Coleman, wide receiver, where does he project? Last, before we go. Well, it, it, a divisive prospect, and understandably so, in truth. I mean, at one point in the college football season, people were talking like he was going to be a top 10 pick, top mm-hmm. 5 pick, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we get to the combine, he runs a 4 6 four, Certainly not a good time by any stretch of the imagination. Looked better running drills. I thought when he ran the gauntlet, that's something that translates more to the next level. He looked good doing it, in all fairness. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of the reception per, uh, perception profile. Something I really enjoy studying, done by Matt Harmon, sort of measuring the success rate of every college receiver on the routes they ran. Doesn't look great for Keon Coleman, too. There's some areas there where he didn't have a lot of success. That might be due to some of the stiffness in the hips, I think. Um, but he's dominant at the catch point. There's no doubt about that. He t- what I like to say, he turns those 50-50 balls into 75-25. Right? It seems like he's always got the advantage when he high points. The question on him, and I'll leave you with this, same question teams will ask, is he T. Higgins or is he Nikhil Harry? Right? Is he a big-bodied guy that can't separate, it's not going to work out, or is he so good, so dominant at the catch point? You know, T. Higgins still has some of those issues coming out, He's just so good, so big, knows how to under, uh, understands how to utilize his size. Keon Coleman could be that type of player. So I feel like there's going to be no middle ground with him. You know what I mean? It's either going to be a success story or it's not. And I, I can't wait to see which one. I'm rooting for him. Really fun player to watch and a good kid from what I understand. Mm-hmm. Justin has tons of content at Justin M underscore yeah. NFL. Uh, Just follow him on Twitter now. Draft Network, Titans MC, and Broadway T. And he is uh, everywhere. And we always appreciate some of your time, sir. Thank you. Pleasure is all mine. Our favorite you, Justin. Canadian, Justin Mello, right there. Uh, always love catching up with him. All right, when we come back, there's a question for Blaine in the chat Uh-oh. about what the Texans are doing. Texans, if you haven't heard, uh, have traded for Stephon Diggs. To give you the particulars on that. And again, a question to Blaine. Very interesting from somebody in the FNM bank chat. We will ask that question Bananas. next on Blaine and Mickey, powered by all four seasons garage doors. Bananas. Allergy season is upon us and pollen is in the air, but fear not. Cool Ray has your back. And our $49 tune-up will have your HVAC system running smoothly, keeping allergens at bay. Plus, enjoy 10% off indoor air quality products for an extra boost. So are you ready to say goodbye to your old HVAC system? Well, with Cool Ray, it's out with the old and in with the new. And we'll even give you $1,000 for your old system when you upgrade with us. That's right. We'll pay you to breathe easier. And with Tennessee's unpredictable weather, it's crucial to be prepared. That's where our whole home generators come in. With $1,500 off, you can keep your home powered up, rain or shine. So don't let Mother Nature catch you off guard. Let Cool Ray be a beacon of reliability. So, Tennessee, are you ready to embrace spring with confidence? Well, give Cool Ray a call today and let us make this season a breeze. We're your partner in comfort no matter the season. So, here's to a spring filled with sunshine, smiles, and stress-free living. Cool Ray, keeping Tennessee cool, plumbing right, and lights bright. So, visit CoolRay.com to take control of your home's comfort. That's CoolRay.com.
Looking for something to do on Eclipse Day? Here you go. You can join your favorite folks from 104.5 The Zone all day at Two Rivers Ford in Mount Juliet. That is Monday, April 8th. For more details, you can visit 1045thezone.com slash events today. You can see all the stuff that's going on, but uh, we're all going to be hanging around out there looking at Fords and and the eclipse. Looking you guys going to be looking eclipse, at the eclipse? Although not really looking at it. We'll be looking through special glasses. Don't look at the eclipse, right? You That's guys, bad. Do you guys remember the last eclipse? Really? In like 2017? Yes. So yep. I went up on the roof of this building and watched it. I got out of uh, school. I you went to yes. Sadna. Went up on the roof of the well, building. That's why. That's why you need glasses because you went too close. I didn't watch it. I just <laughs> looked around. If you're at the ground level. I don't. I don't think you have any issues. Just look it up there. It's far, far away. Yeah, but you can't look at it. <laughs> it will make you man. blind. Like don't look at yeah, it. Yeah, the sun will. It'll burn your. Yeah, it'll glasses. burn your eyes out. It really? You, yeah, yeah, you'll be. I've looked at it every year. Maybe well, that's why I got explain. glasses. Yeah, I was gonna say, look, you got glasses on now. <laughs> yeah, right. your eyes have holes in them now. I'm like, I'll be driving, just like, oh, there it is. Yep, on can't do porch. it. And what's crazy though is you <laughs> think, what what's this gonna be like? And like the street lights come on, the crickets start chirping. It's nuts. It turns that same to night. cricket that was in here. Hundred percent, Bert. Yeah, left a Bert's, cricket Bert's chirping crickets. sound in here. He he put something in here. That's what they're telling us now. Our man Bananas was in on this. I may or may not have been in on it. Oh my, you you stinkers. Yeah, stinkers. That's mm-hmm. a radio friendly way of saying it. Uh, <laughs> Stephon Diggs to the Texans. The Texans. Uh, have acquired Stefan Diggs. There's an account on our F and M bank chat called Stupid, but yeah, mm. that's what it is. Oh, that, that's my. So we'll just say S B Y said. S B Y. Blaine is a player. How do you cope with a rival doing everything you've done to improve, but then much more as a fan? He says it's extremely discouraging, especially while we are still in purgatory, which I'm sure he means rebuild. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Players don't. I mean. Players just think, I'm going to get better and we're going to win. That's what we're – but fans certainly get tied up in stuff like this. <laughs> oh, no, no doubt. No doubt about it. Um, as a player, you know, I, I would look at it as a drive just to continue to get better. Uh, I mean, man, you could say, oh, man, they're going full force, man. We, <laughs> I got to get <laughs> – we're going they're going to be throwing the ball a lot, man. I'm, I got to get ready. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I, I don't think we ever – as players looked at like they're getting ahead of us and we're falling behind. I think that's what he's really trying to say. Cause you, you don't have control of it. You know, it's the, you know, the GM and the scouting department versus theirs. And we're at different points of where we are with our team compared to their team. So I, I think most players just kind of departmentalize and just kind of control what you can control really at the same time, because it's, this is a business where it's about your production as an individual. So if you don't stay on top of your game, it will end really quick. So can't seem to worry about that as much, but you are watching the moves. You're you're watching the draft even, let on, you know, your team, other teams and everything else because you kind of watch, you know, college ball, especially the elite players uh, that go high in the draft. So you always kind of want to get an early jump on scouting those those guys. So, yeah, I, 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 you don't even think about it, to be honest. I Yeah, it's like, dang it, they got another player. I got to get ready. Right. Man, and being a defensive back, they got all these receivers. Sure. I'm like, oh, man, I better get get my cover skills down pat. So that's your division. So you're thinking, okay, I'm going to go pull some tape on digs because I know I'm going to see him twice next year. Yeah, most yeah. players believe they can beat him regardless. That's, it's a team sport. So yeah. ultimately, you know, there's a lot of factors on why you win, regardless if you have the best talent or not. Always the best talent doesn't always win. The best teams do, especially if you, you, know, you play without error. And that means like turnovers and things of that nature. I definitely know Sneed and Ouzi are probably out there just like, I'm going to go beat Diggs now. Yeah, uh, DHB Wait, you know, in the chat says, put Sneed on Dale and Cheeto on Diggs and McCreary on Collins and let's play ball. Well, does <laughs> he it, got it all figured out. Doesn't Dale think Dale play more in their slot? Well, or is he, he, is he, he an moved, outside guy? Uh, he moved, they, they moved the guys around. I mean, then. Doesn't really matter, man. When you're in the pros, man, everybody's really good. You got to bring your best. It's who got your A game that day. Mm-hmm. You know, really, that's what it's all about. You know, you can try to match up. But during the regular season, most uh, teams try to just play your side. And then when you get in the playoffs, if you end up meeting up, you know, you kind of do that then. 
So the Texans are making moves. A new wide receiver. We talked a little bit about this. What does this mean for the Titans? Maybe do they lean a little bit more towards pass rush early in the draft? We can get into that and more. Kevin wants to weigh in on it. 615-737-1045. That will get you on the Blaine and Mickey show as we start the second half of the Hump Day show next. Oh, man, you can bet the NBA with a no-sweat same-game parlay from FanDuel. You can do it every Thursday night with TNT Thursdays. You know you love the TNT Thursday night crew. They're the best. And, look, it doesn't matter if you're new to FanDuel. If you already got an account, you'll get bonus bets back. If your same-game parlay doesn't win on any NBA on TNT game, NBA same-game parlays are the perfect way to combine your bets for a chance to score a bigger payday. Like, you know, Jalen Brunson, he always gets his points. Uh, Alex Sabonis cleaning up the boards. I like the Knicks to win, though, in what should be a fun Thursday night matchup. However you want to play, though, you just head to FanDuel.com slash Mickey. You can bet the NBA, too, with a no-sweat same-game parlay with TNT Thursdays. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash Mickey. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. you got to be 21 or older. Present in Tennessee, minimum three-leg parlay required. Refund issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets. Expire seven days after receipt. Max refund five bucks unless otherwise specified. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call the Tennessee Red Line at one 800 889 Nine seven eight nine.
Good afternoon. It is 2 o'clock right on the dot. I'm Joseph Bonanno. Breaking news in the NFL this morning as the AFC South gets just a bit tougher after the Texans trade for former Vikings and Bills wide receiver Stephon Diggs sending a 2025 second round pick to Buffalo. Diggs now joins C.J. Stroud, Nico Collins, Tank Dell, among others on that Texans offense. Tennessee Titans officially introduced cornerback Legereus Sneed on Tuesday in a press conference after acquiring him in a trade with the Chiefs. Sneed talked about being a lockdown corner and the importance of taking away the opponent's top receiver, one that the Texans might have just gotten. Oh, man, you know, if I can eliminate one guy, you know, their best player on the field, it helps everybody else around us, you know, just like the guys on the D-line. You know, he gets to the quarterback, he helps us out on the back end. And that's how I feel like on Mills with the corner spot. Titans general manager Rand Carthon also spoke to the media after Sneed and said that there is still time to address the front end of the defense in free agency. From a free agency standpoint, free agency is open. It's not over. So we're going to continue to look. And then obviously we got the draft, which is taking our focus now. Um, so we're going to continue to look to add, you know, up front um, on, on all sides of the ball. Um, but it, we're, we're still working on that. Nashville Predators dropped a three straight game, a third straight game with a three nothing loss to the Bruins last night at Bridgestone Arena. All three goals coming in the third period. They'll take on the St. Louis Blues tomorrow night. Nashville Sounds played their home opener on Tuesday, finishing out the game through the rain delays and winning 5 4 over the St. Paul Saints. They'll go again tonight at 6 35. For Argo Foundation Repair and Waterproof and Needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Balls. This is 1045 The Zone. Blaine and Mickey, halfway through the halfway through the week show. It's the nexus of the Sports Talk universe. We appreciate you spending it with us. Uh, as you are going to hear on this station, the Titans, AFC South mates, the Texans, they've had a busy offseason. Made a trade with the Bills for Stephon Diggs. The Bills get a 2025 second-round pick. Not this year, 2025. The Texans get Diggs, a 2024 sixth, and a 2025 fifth-round pick. What does it translate to? People are speculating that uh, like maybe a Diggs round was, pick? Yeah. Uh, a second next year, a sixth this year for Diggs, a sixth this year, and a fifth next year. And the second that they traded was one they got from Minnesota. Yeah. From when they traded away their first round pick. Oh. So Dang. they still have a second in 2025. They just got rid of the other one that they had. Wow. Uh, Carlos says in the FNM Bank chat, it's costing the Bills more in dead cap to let Diggs go than it was to keep him on the roster, which was $27.9 yeah. million. That means they shouldn't have given him that extension last year. Oh, that was a ding-dongery move. $31 million in dead cap space for the Bills. That is yeah. more than Josh Allen's cap space in 2024, yeah, which is man. at like 30. Yeah, my man McDermott, he's, he's, he's going to be in trouble this year. But, uh, you know, I, I think you're going down the road of, you know, Diggs, you know, he's a personality. And I just don't know people really, you know, you got to you got to appease to that when you want a dominant player who's like that. So, you know, you got to get him in the rock. I mean, he was always talking to Josh Allen, whether he was talking to him, yelling at him, throw me the ball. I don't know what he was actually saying, mm -hmm. but, um, you, you know, you just got to know you got who you're dealing with. And, uh and if they had conversations before, it seems like he was just frustrated over these last two seasons at the end there, and they lose in the playoffs. He was just – all right, remember they I almost said they like he uh, – they were going to trade him the year before. And uh, so, I just, you know, he's one of those uh, guys you always got to come over and have conversations with because mm -hmm. he's – He's let, you know, he lets his competitive spirit get in. A lot of people call that malcontent and he's a cancer and all these things. He's not a cancer when you're winning. It's when he, when you lose, it, it becomes that. So you got to understand what you're getting. And so different coaches and their personalities match up well. And I, I think uh, Ron's, uh, you know, the head coach of the Texans uh, is used to dealing with players like that. And it won't be an issue at all. Where in Buffalo and maybe even Minnesota, you know, where he was with before, it became, oh, my gosh, this guy's hard to deal with. 
I think a lot of coaches don't look at it that way. It depends on your personal relationship and understanding the actual human being you're dealing with and knowing how to talk to him and make sure that doesn't let his competitive spirits come out, you know, in a, in a bad way. So I, I don't have any problem with those type of players because uh, I know there's some good behind of that and they want to they win at the utmost. So let's just uh, get him to rock any way we can. <laughs> so that's how I kind of view it. I, you know, I, it, it's funny. I don't like the narrative of he's a cancer when you lose, but when you win and he's just great. Right. Like, like, you know, he's the same guy both times. It, it doesn't change. It's how you deal with it. And him too, by the way, how you deal with it, with the losing in, in critical moments and then showing up. So there were some games, uh, as Banana brought up, you know, uh, that, you know, his stats didn't equal what they're doing. I mean, because I didn't feel like Davis, he didn't even play in the uh, playoffs. Uh, the opposite receiver really stood up and, and matched and, and made people take the double off of Diggs. So, you know. Does this I mean we knew they needed more pass rush? We knew they needed cornerbacks. They've shored up the cornerback position. They've done a good job of that. With they didn't do it through the draft. They spent money on that. They went in after those guys in free agency. We've talked a lot about maybe the oh, the guy from Missouri Robinson, who's the yeah, Denico yeah, like. comp body type wise. Oh, I don't know if he'll play there. like that. Mm -hmm. But and we know they need offensive line help, but they sure need more pass rush. And, mm -hmm. you know, Big Jeff needs a running mate uh, regularly. So it seems like this, we know they need a left tackle and a right tackle and some other stuff. But we also now know that they really need more pass rush help. You mm. know? I know. It's becoming very evident. And I don't know who's out there and available in free agency. So you may have to address this in the draft. Boy, the guy that I want, and he hasn't signed, but supposedly he's going to go, Mike Dana, who plays for the Chiefs 51. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. He's... Sort of a, a hybrid guy. He's not the biggest guy, but they say he can move a little bit inside and a little bit outside. But six and a half sacks, uh, and like seventy percent of the snaps or so. Which I know that's oh, not huge. That's, that's not huge, yeah. but he's steady. He always has the same numbers. He's a hustle guy. He hasn't signed anywhere. But supposedly now that they've uh, gotten rid of Snead, they can pay some other people, and mm -hmm. he's maybe one of those guys that was like, "Oh, I'm mm -hmm. not leaving here. I'm just waiting for the money to drop." Uh, so Mike Dan is a guy that I like. Who's a pass rusher. Uh, an edge guy who they also say can move inside. But uh, if you start Googling him, or you're like, I forgot he made that play. Oh, shoot, he was right there next to Chris Jones. They made that play. Mm -hmm. He's that guy. He's like a glue guy on their team. Yeah, yeah, and those guys are very, very, you know, important to your roster too, by the way. We had a lot of glue guys. So, yeah, I understand what they bring to the table, and they never their motor never stops. Yep. And they're always in the right spots. So, yeah, they they if you don't get an elite, you got to get that guy. Uh, let's get some of these guys and gals. Let's get to the phone, 615-737-1045. Kevin will lead us off. What's up, Kevin? Hey, guys. How you doing? Good. I'm good. Hey, Blaine, I got a quick question for you. Because mm -hmm. you've been around Amy, and you kind of know the person as a woman, as a owner, and you also knew her dad. Mm -hmm. So do you think that with the Texans making move, that it would push her or – not necessarily push her, but push the Titans franchise to counter their moves. I mean, how, how do you think she would feel if Houston won a championship before the Titans? So my question <laughs> is, do you, think that there is, do you think there is a little push in her to make sure that she goes across the finish line and carries her daddy with her in memory yeah. just for the sake of the Houston area? Thank you, brother. Y'all have yeah. a good one. Kevin, yeah, that is a – Man, does – that cricket, it was listened to because we were just talking about this off air <laughs> in between the break, me and Mickey. You know, that that is an issue. I said, you know, they were the caller asked about beforehand about, you know, the pressure to the players when they make moves like this, especially the Texans, as we were referring to with the digs. I said, you know who really feels the pressure is upstairs. Mm -hmm. They're the ones because they want to stay ahead of not only division opponents, but the Texan. It's a, it's a personal deal there. So, uh I don't know if it's it comes down as as oh make moves or oh I'm willing to spend a little bit more right here, so if it's a guy available, so I don't I don't you know right now you know the top elite guys are pretty much done. Maybe you can get Justin Simmons at safety, and now all of a sudden you go from ah we're only going to spend seven million episodes, you know we'll spend ten right. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that's the really the only impact. But yeah, will it hurt uh, if they like won a championship? Oh, absolutely. But you can't. You, every team is at different spots, you know. So the Texans were the same position they were two years ago, and they were chasing the the Titans. So I think they're doing a good job. And I, I know it's not probably going as fast as they want, but it's it's a process that you you just can't hurry up. You got to make you know quality decisions, and I think that's what they're doing. So I think I think she's on board with that. Uh, you know, as long as everybody is all all in to, to try to do the best they can to build the best roster this year and see where it ends up. I'm uh, pretty cool. I know a lot of people are saying they're building on defense from the back end to the front end. That is not intentional. They are making these moves because that's what available. You can't try to build the front end when there's no guys available. I mean, let's use common sense here. There is nobody available that they like to spend that kind of money. So they say, well, but there are some secondary guys. So eventually, at some point, we got to get our front guys. Now, you're going to try to piecemeal it along the way, but you can't force it. Mm-hmm. And that's when you can go wrong and, and make some bad decisions. So I think that's why I say I think they're making some good decisions. Now, by the way, you sign these corners and, you know, next thing you know, if you don't get any pressure, they're still going to get beat. They may disrupt timing. Right. So you got to, you know, you got to get to your point there, Mickey, you got to get some guys up front, at least another quality, whether it's at D tackle or in to, you know, get some some heat on a quarterback because you don't want to be blitzing all the time, which I think they're going to be an aggressive defense right now based off what their their moves they're making and where they're spending the money. Ooh, boy. That's why I say the back end and the front end have to match up. And that's when you have an elite mm-hmm. defense. Yeah, if you just got some average NFL guys on the back end, you're, you're not going to be in elite defense when the Titans had an elite front four, which they did. Right. Going into the last season, it was never going to match up that way. One one thing that what that caller was talking about is we played the audio yesterday of Rand talking about how they got Calvin Ridley and how it was a pivot move. Mm. Like they had like brought it up, but then they kind of didn't think it was going. And then once they saw what happened with Nico Autry, well, he didn't say exactly well, the Nico Autry and Aziz. Yeah. They were like, all right, let's make a pivot and let's go make a splash. That's exactly what she did. And she was on board the entire time. Yeah. That's, that's what Rand said. So, yeah, she's definitely all in on uh, – on. Um, yeah, and she even yeah. called him and said – he said that she said, oh, we got Ridley. Oh, we got, right. we got him. Just this minutes, happened? Like, minutes this later, real? yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know what that tells me? She's letting her guys – Make the decisions, and she's all on board. Like, hey, whatever I can to help, let's let's make it happen. That means moolah. <laughs> let Rain cook. That's <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, let Rain cook. Hear me, <laughs> Carthan. Let's let Malika cook here, right? Quick. Oh, it's Malika Andrews. Uh, maybe it is six one five seven three seven one zero four five. Hey, Malika. Oh no, Malika Andrews like basketball. <laughs> I love the one at all. Thanks for taking my call. Um, the happiest. DJs on 104.5 The Zone and all that. Um, yeah, I want to talk about the Titans. Um, their moves are amazing. No fear. Uh, have no fear that Jerry Smith is here. I just think um, Mike Rabel has gone. Hallelujah. And, um, <laughs> with, yeah, with, with uh, Ryan, uh, Brian and Bill Callahan, um, they know what to do. So, yeah, um, hopefully we can win the Super Bowl. Um, ASAP, tighten up, and let's see what's what happens. Thanks, guys. Well, we appreciate you, Malika. Always great hearing from you. Uh, we got to hear from Jordan Dejani. He's going to join us next, our man from CBS Sports. We got lots of NFL stuff. We got breaking news, digs to the Texans. Let's get to all of it next with JD on B and M, powered by All Four Seasons Garage Doors. M and B. Did you know Eurofix has a very different business philosophy? They staff all their locations with more staff than the average auto repair shop. Just so they can be ready for when your emergency pops up out of nowhere. And have you ever noticed how hard it is to get a right now appointment for a vehicle repair? Well, some dealers can be even more than two weeks out just to get a freaking appointment. But not Eurofix. Eurofix has been offering quality repairs that beat the dealer without the dealer pricing since 1999. Plus, they have a three-year nationwide warranty and the staff to fix your car right now. 
So if you are tired of waiting forever to get your car into the shop, then call Eurofix. Owner Aaron Stokes says, we will never be too busy for our customers. We're here to take their pain away, and we mean right now. And Eurofix repairs all European cars. Eurofix says yes to speedy repair when others can't or won't. Family owned for 24 years. And all you have to do is just give them a call at 844-EUROFIX. That's right, 844-EUROFIX, or you can just visit them online at myeurofix.com. That's myeurofix.com. But I always tell them Blaine said, Jeff.
Well, well, it make you trying to survive through a surviving? rainy Wednesday here. We're just surviving. Oh, I think the Titans are trying to survive the, the Texans. They win, though, didn't they? I think yesterday yeah, we all survived. Great. We anybody who was affected by those storms, man, thoughts yeah, and uh, thoughts to you, prayers to you. We, we kind of dodged a mess here in Middle Tennessee, though. So, yeah. uh, whew, that was some scary stuff. Mm-hmm. Jordan Janney, he was out there watching the weather. I actually saw him tweet about it yesterday. JD uh, with CBS Sports, we dodged one with the weather yesterday, man. What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me on the show. Hope you're surviving and thriving at this time of year. Yeah, you know, you talk about the weather yesterday. There's no doubt that we dodged the bullet. I was one of those guys kind of rooting on the tornadoes, though, to take the pollen out of the air because I'm so allergic to the stuff that is in the air this time of year. Spring is not my favorite time of year. So we definitely needed the rain, and I'm excited that we got some yesterday. Oh, man, you just going to make me cheer for tornadoes now because the pollen just destroys my allergies, but... So after tornadoes hit, that that takes the pollen away. The rain doesn't do it. Well, uh, the the rain definitely does it. It'll give my rain car makes it a worse. nice wash. So it's so it's gray instead of yellow again. But all I know about tornadoes are that they are big windstorms, and that windstorms can take the pollen away from my house, which I'm the oh. big fan. Of. I'll take my chances mm. uh, without that for sure. Uh, Texans <laughs> are taking their chances on everybody, uh, although. Well, they didn't have to trade too much to get Stefan Diggs. What the heck is going on there? The Bills eating a bunch of dead money. What What's going on? Yeah, my goodness. When you look at this trade compensation just at face value, it's pretty eye-popping, right? Mm. The Bills are sending Stefan Diggs a four-time Pro Bowl wideout, plus a 2024 sixth-rounder, 2025 fifth-rounder, all in exchange for a 2025 second rounder. It's not even a second rounder this year. It's a mm. second rounder after Houston wins the Super Bowl next year. Just kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. No, oh, man. You hurt people's feelings. <laughs> oh, that yeah, I know Titans fans don't want to hear it, but but uh, but Houston's done a tremendous job this offseason. Yeah. I mean, if you ask me before even this acquisition, um, the team that had helped themselves the most through free agency, I would have argued about the Houston Texans. And, and in fact, I even wrote a column uh, a couple weeks ago, about five underrated storylines we are not talking about enough in the NFL offseason. And one of those is about how the Houston Texans are doing things the right way. They got their franchise quarterback in place. They know that he's going to be a star. So when this guy is coming cheap on his rookie deal, this is when you attempt to go all in. Not just on the offensive side, on the defensive side of the ball as well. And the Texans have made some splash moves, right? Daniel Hunter, Joe Mixon, now Stephon Diggs. But a reason I really like what the Texans have done is some of these under-the-radar signings, right? Some of these re-signings, whether it's Tim Settle, Mario Edwards, Foley Fatukasi on the defensive line. They also re-signed Derek Barnett, Vol legend, re-signed tight end Dalton Schultz, took a flyer on former number three overall pick Jeff Fakuda in the secondary. I really like what the Texans have done so far. And this acquisition of Stephon Diggs just shows you that further that they are all in. They're trying to be legitimate contenders in the NFL. Hanging out with our man Jordan DeJani here on Blaine and Mickey. Yeah, yeah. Bananas came up with this question. Uh, he texted us earlier in the show, man. Which team uh, you just maybe gave us the answers? Then the best offseason thus far. Texans are, are the Titans. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I would argue just overall, especially with the Stephon Diggs acquisition, I would say that it's probably the Houston Texans. And again, I, I think... Most of my reasoning also goes toward some of the re-signings and, again, under-the-radar guys that they added on defense. That's a big reason I would argue Houston. But when it comes to splash moves, I mean, the Titans are right up there with, with what they've done with Legarius Steed, Calvin Ridley, Tony Pollard, Lloyd Cushenberry. Uh, Tennessee's done a tremendous job. And, you know, it's kind of funny because it's puzzling some national guys, right? People who don't follow the Titans looking looking at them as a team that is not going to be in contention next year, that are objectively in the state of trying to rebuild this roster. But the front office is not exactly acting like that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I feel like that's a really good thing because you want to get the most out of your young rookie quarterback that you look at and believe he has franchise potential. So giving him protection, giving him weapons in the backfield and out wide with Calvin Ridley, that's a really a good idea for Tennessee to do. So – even if this is a two-year, three-year rebuild, whatever it may be, you're going to have a better understanding of what some of your core pieces are capable of when they have a good support system around them. I know the Titans are uh, in the process of building a new stadium, but, man, could the Chiefs possibly be moving? I know uh, their state, I guess, rejected the renovations of the Chiefs and the Royals Stadium. Do you know anything Mm -hmm. about this? 
I did see this headline, and to be honest with you, I didn't really look too far into it because, you know, we've run into some situations with really good NFL teams that are very similar to this Mm -hmm. before. If you remember last year or two years ago, we talked about the Buffalo Bills potentially, Mm -hmm. you know, relocating and going somewhere else. But, you know, I always stuck to my gun saying, listen, Buffalo has a tremendous fan base. They have a great sense of loyalty. A lot of this can be politicking, right, when it comes to renovations or building a new stadium. So, again, I haven't really looked too much into the Kansas City Chiefs storyline. It's certainly an interesting headline when it talks about potential relocation or whatever may come with changes with location. But, I mean, Kansas City, these are the reigning Super Bowl champions. They're going for the three-peat. They have a tremendous fan base, the most marketable and slash best quarterback in the National Football League as well. Um, So I don't know how dramatic this is really going to get. Well, let's stay with Kansas City, man. Uh, something on a serious note there with the Rasheed Rice uh, incident there uh, with, I guess, race, and I, I don't know what was uh, the deal there. But uh, kind of take us through that and what the NFL policy is and what you think they will do, if anything. Yeah, it was pretty tough waking up on Easter morning and seeing that first thing on my phone that, you know, Rasheed Rice was part of a major incident near Dallas. Uh, fortunately, no one was seriously hurt, according to reports, and no one lost their lives, which, of course, is the most important thing with a story like this. Um, and now it really comes down to the facts that a, a car was registered to Rasheed Rice. We don't know if he was driving, um, which I feel like might be a really important thing to focus on as this investigation continues to progress. But, man, I mean, if, if everything that's being alleged is true, like, you can't be this dumb. As a, as a young man with so much power who has your dream job, to be putting other people's lives at risk to street race, it's just something you're not supposed to do, especially when we're on the heels of the Henry Ruggs incident and other mm-hmm. tragedies that have happened around the NFL – you got to be you got to be careful with how you interact and how you deal with yourself off the field man so that's a that's a really scary story something that definitely didn't i didn't want coming across my phone but you know the chiefs have vowed to really get to the bottom of what exactly happened but if they get to the bottom of it and and rasheed rice is responsible for a near tragedy then you have to imagine that some kind of significant punishment could be handed down not only by the chiefs but by the nfl as well so when we have more details about this story, it'll be better to it'll we'll be in a better position to speculate on what potentially could happen. But yeah, not a good story at all. Mm. Couple of fun questions after something serious like that. Uh, <laughs> this you know naturally this was uh, for Mickey, but uh, rumors that the Browns are going to be switching to the white face mask that led me to think about as it should be. Do you you like that? And who in the NFL has the best helmets? Oh, that's that's a good one. Uh, first of all, yes, I love going back to the white face mask. Uh, that's that's definitely as it should be. It yes, just, yes, it's fresh. It's fresh. It looks good. It stands out. It pops on your TV. I, I think it's. A, I think absolutely, it's a great one. Now, when it comes to best helmets, uh, geez, I mean, I'm kind of partial, but I, I kind of like the the Titans flaming thumbtack. I'm a big fan of that. I'm interested on. I have a question for you guys. Do you like the blue helmets better than the white helmets? Because I don't know. I grew up with the white helmets, of course, and I feel like I'm a little partial to that. Uh, but when it comes to other helmets around the National Football League, you know, I, I kind of like the Vikings helmets. I like having the little horn sticking out. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, the New England Patriots have an interesting logo on the side of it. I, I don't know if I have a favorite helmet, in my opinion. All right. Well, I'm sure Mickey will have something else. But another fun question is. Uh, the odds that the NFL will do first. Think about this. Two questions. Playing every day of the week, a game will be played. Which what will happen sooner? Or twenty game season. So playing Whoa. every day of the week or a twenty game season. What will happen first? Okay. You know, I'm going to lean towards a 20-game season, which sounds absolutely preposterous with the amount of games. I mean, players don't like playing 16. Now it's going to 17, then potentially 18 down the line. I I think that a 20-game season would be probably closer to the NFL playing on every day. But you know what's interesting is that if we're speculating on both of these, you know, possibilities, one thing that go could go hand in hand with this is league expansion. And league expansion mm. not only in the U.S. Overseas. but maybe internationally. Yep. Exactly. Overseas as well, because that will give you more flexibility when it comes to playing on certain days 
being more flexible with bye weeks as well, further into the season. And then also just more games in general, um, having more teams doing that. So I think that expansion, again, not only in the U.S., but potentially overseas, whenever that comes. I don't know how close that is, but I'm sure that the NFL is exploring it as it continues to try to, you know, increase its global footprint. We're seeing that with international games as well. NFL writer Jordan DeJani bringing the heat. Um, I saw you had made note of this. Aaron Rodgers made a cool $81.14 to carry out the flag <laughs> for the uh, Jets last year, and Brock Purdy doubled his salary, essentially, out of the same pool of money. <laughs> yeah, how about this? I, You know, this is something that I feel like a lot of people aren't aware of, but the NFL's performance-based pay system, which – it has to do with your performance, of course, but also it has to do with number of plays as well. If you're getting significant playing time, you're going to have a chance to up those numbers. And, you know, someone like Aaron Rodgers, who's already signed to a lucrative contract, he doesn't seem like a player that's going to make a lot of money coming off of just the, the flat number of plays played. But I guess whatever it was, what was it, four snaps he played before he suffered that season-ending torn Achilles? That's worth $81.14. He's getting paid by the hour a lot better than I am and a lot better than other people are around the world as well. So, yeah, I made that joke that, you know, the highlight of Aaron Rodgers' season, unfortunately, was him carrying out the flag for that night game on September 11th because that, that was a pretty cool moment. And, yeah, he made $81.14 for doing that. I don't know if he's making $81 an hour, but Legereus Snee got his new deal. The financials have been announced, and we've all heard from him. Just kind of your thoughts on the Legereus Snee now that there's a bow on it, and he's officially a Titan and everything. I'm super excited, and I can tell by your guys' coverage of it yesterday on 104.5 The Zone that you guys are as well. I think that this is a massive acquisition for just a number of different reasons. I mean, we've talked about how Tennessee has been lacking on the back end defensively for several years now, and you go out there and you sign maybe a top five, at least the top ten cornerback in the National Football League, while also adding another boundary cornerback earlier in free agency, that's a huge deal. And this is someone who has championship aspirations because he's someone who's done it before, twice, with the best team in the NFL. So he's not only someone that's talented and can be a very versatile chess piece on the defensive end, but he's also someone who knows how to lead, right? And he knows how to foster that kind of culture that's going to be successful in today's NFL. And that's the thing we're not talking about enough when it comes to this acquisition is that Legereus Sneed knows how things are supposed to be done. So you're adding a very important voice in your locker room um, who can really take this defense and take this franchise, this team, to another level. Hanging out with Jordan Janney of CBS Sports here on Blaine and Mickey, just like we do every Wednesday at this time. Mm -hmm. Well, under the radar signing because – you know, you cut one player who was an elite player then to sign another one, and that is Aaron Jones, a running back for Green Bay, released, and then Josh Jacobs signed immediately right after that. What was going on there with Aaron Jones? Would he They wanted him to take another pay cut, or what happened there? Yeah, I'm sure they probably wanted him to take a bit of a pay cut. You're, you're getting significantly younger at the running back position, okay. and as soon as those guys get 29, 30 years old is when you want to start to look for an out. And I think that's basically what Green Bay did because I believe Aaron Jones is 29 years old. Um, I saw some interesting comments coming out from uh, Titans legend Matt LaFleur saying that he was a little caught off guard by – the Packers cutting Aaron Jones loose. Uh, I don't know how much I really believe that because he's someone who's probably <laughs> in lockstep with the path the organization wants to take. But I, I think the more interesting part about this is, is the contract that they gave Josh Jacobs. Because if you guys recall, um, I, I was not believing that running backs were going to find any kind of you know financial growth yeah, when it came to their market yeah. this offseason. But they, but a couple of guys did with Saquon Barkley and Josh Jacobs. And again, we can spend an entire segment on the running back situation, but it's pretty interesting that Green Bay wanted to put some financial resources into Josh Jacobs because if you give your young quarterback in Jordan Love that support system of a legitimate ground game, that's going to lead to him and, or excuse me, it's going to lead to expediting his growth as a young quarterback for sure. So I think that was a pretty interesting thing for the Packers to do because again, I was really curious to see how the running backs were going to fare in free agency. And at least two of these guys did really well for themselves. Mm. Well, I was curious. Hassan Riddick uh, also got traded from the Eagles, I think, to the Jets. What, what happened? Was he not just a scheme fit for the new D.C.? I mean, he's a you know quality player. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it was interesting because we've seen this story pop up a couple of times this offseason. Hassan Reddick asking for a trade and saying he wasn't asking for a trade and he wants to remain with Philadelphia. And ultimately, uh, he ends up getting dealt to the New York Jets. So, you know, it seems like there's a lot of Eagles players who really didn't like the system that they were playing in in 2023. Now, of course, it's going to be an entirely different system with Vic Fangio at the helm. But Hassan Reddick, to your point, has been a, a productive player no matter where he's been. Um, and so adding or adding him to so, someone like the New York Jets, a, a team that, in my opinion, has one of the most underrated defenses in the entire National Football League. They did lose one of their pass rushers in Huff this offseason. So filling, filling his shoes with Reddick, someone who's been there before, is something that's really going to help this Jets team, which, again, not only their defense, but I feel like the New York Jets have been one of the more underrated storylines this entire offseason because we were so excited about this squad last offseason when they added Aaron Rodgers. He goes down with his torn Achilles. What exactly are we expecting from this team in 2024, right? Aaron Rodgers has this superpower when it comes to proving the doubters wrong, and he's got the backing of one of the best defenses that's only bolstered by the addition of Hassan Reddick. The New York Jets are going to be one of the more intriguing teams to watch in 2024. Hanging out with Jordan and Janney here, talking all things football and more. Uh, CBS Sports, you can read his writing there. Any early UFL, well, or it's the USXFL to me. Uh, how about this? The kicker's showing out early. you got dudes kicking 64-yarders and YouTube yes. stars who are kickoff stars yeah. now. I mean, yeah, I kickers. Watched game. I watched a couple games. Too. See, even Blaine's bought into this. Mm-hmm. Blaine watched a little bit more than I did, to be yeah, honest with you, because it didn't it didn't really match up well with the calendar, man. It's Easter weekend, so I'm not on the couch watching football. I'm out hanging out with family and doing Easter egg hunts and stuff like that. But I did see, was it Jake Bates of the Michigan Panthers? This is probably the biggest story. He hit a 64-yard field goal, um, which led to multiple NFL teams, including the Lions, reportedly reaching out to see um, you know, if he would be available to join their their squad. And what was interesting was it was a game-winning field goal, but he hit it twice because the opposing team called timeout. And this was apparently his first field goal attempt since high school. And there's only two kickers in NFL history who have hit from that distance or further, meaning Jake Bates is, of course, Canton bound. So now there's (laughs) NFL interest around this kicker. Um, So that was a pretty cool storyline to come out of it. Another thing that I noticed was, you know, we're talking about Um, transparency when it comes to officiating, right? These reps are mic'd up and we're hearing the entire process when it comes to throwing the flag, what exactly you saw, relaying that to the head official, and then, of course, the announcement over the the speakers. And the NFL, if one thing, they are not transparent about their officiating process. And that's one thing, uh, the next thing that they should probably take from the UFL's book. Hanging out with Jordan Ajani here, CBS Sports. Well, Jordan, uh, last I got to give you five. I know you're a UT guy, but uh, who is the best women's basketball player in Tennessee's uh, history in your eyes? And how do they stack up versus uh, Caitlin Clark? Well, is Candace Parker? Is that the obvious yeah, answer? Obviously, you know, right? I, 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 oh, Claw, yeah, Holes Claw, yeah. Holes Claw. I mean, yeah. Oh, true, true. That, that's a good one, too. Yeah, I'd probably lean towards Candace Parker, but. It's interesting because, like, I don't know if you guys had this debate, but who is the best, you know, women's basketball player of all time Mm -hmm. among the collegiate ranks? Because Kaylin Clark definitely uh, has an argument for that, in my opinion. I mean, for what she's done in terms of sparking the game, like that that matchup against LSU, that was the most excited I've I've been to watch a basketball Mm -hmm. game, a women's basketball game in quite some time. And it definitely lived up to the hype as well. I mean, she's got a little Steph Curry to her, right? She can pull up from absolutely anywhere. And what's cool about her, I'll say this real quick, is that I, she popped up on my sports radar a couple of years ago for her incredible shots, but she's really developed into a well-rounded player where mm-hmm. she's getting the most out of her teammates as well. And that's why Iowa has a great chance to, to win the national championship. So watching her is an absolute joy. I absolutely love watching shooters who can pull up from anywhere, but also that quality of being able to make your teammates better uh, is invaluable as well. Yeah. She has no championships though. So yeah. True. Jordan, yet, anyway. Jordan and CBS Sports have got all the championships of covering the NFL, though. Nobody does it better at Jordan DeJenny and, of course, CBSSports.com. You can do – there's just tons of draft content and everything there all the time with Jordan and his crew. Thank you, as always, for the time, buddy. Appreciate it, J.D.
Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me on the show. And, yeah, I'll, I'll be coming out with a mock draft next week, and I'll make sure to put DJ Uh-oh. Bird somewhere in the first round. All right. Oh, we'll, we'll be look, all over we'll it. We'll be reading it for sure. Put it out there. Drop it like it's hot. Jordan Nijani, always great <laughs> catching up with him. When we come back, we're going to catch up with Jason from the borough. He's on the line, 615-737-1045. The whole idea about the Texans and what they're doing and how does this affect Amy Adams Strunk, who still lives in Houston, I would imagine, has a residence there and a long legacy there. Jason wants to take that uh, topic and run with it, and we will do that. And you can join that topic next on Blaine and Mickey again, 615-737-1045. We're powered by All Four Seasons Garage Doors. All right, here's what's going on with me. It's coming in, laying on the couch, going to sleep after work, not at bedtime. Then bedtime came and I had trouble going to sleep, had trouble staying asleep. Just didn't feel like myself, tired all the time. So I went to see the good folks at Edge Peptide Therapy. Not Edge, they're going to check your levels on a whole lot of things, including testosterone, because a lot of people are experiencing low testosterone. It seems to happen earlier and earlier in men. But I also got my vitamin levels checked and other things. Turns out I'm super low on B12. That's something that I found out. Well, guess what? That could affect things like sleep. I'm learning all this stuff. Because here's what the crew at Edge Peptide want to do. Their goal is to make bodies feel better from the inside out. Hormone therapy, peptide therapy, regenerative therapy, and so much more. And right now, just go make an appointment. They're doing an everyday low pricing of 99 bucks a month for testosterone therapy. Look, you can't take care of everybody. You can't be Superman if you don't feel like yourself. So go to edgepeptide.com. Or call now and make that appointment, 615-724-1878. The guaranteed offer is the easiest way to sell your home. It's really simple. We bring you an all-cash offer. You close in as little as 21 days. No home inspections, no lockboxes, no open houses. Go to MarkSpain.com to get a guaranteed offer and start packing.
I don't think we stay on the air long enough to let this song kick in. Blaine and Mickey. Oh, I, I love this song. Now we're by All Four Seasons Garage Doors and Trust Matters. I'll tell you who likes this song is Brian Harson. This was on every pregame playlist. This he love he loves this song. Yeah. On game days at A State or in the one year Harson era, be walking around down on the field and this song will be playing. You can count on it. Mm. It's a good soundtrack for air uh, for mm, Jason. This, this is a, this is one of my pregame songs. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See this is a little would you, bit. Of, would you play yeah. this like early, uh-huh. like early Remember, in the pregame? What do I need? Relax. But now it kicks in pretty good at the end. Yes, yeah, right. And then boop, 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 boop. You got it. Boop, boop, boop. Let's just make this a soundtrack for Jason's call from the borough. Sounds like Jason's riding hey. down the road here. What's up, Jason? I don't know music. What's going on, guys? You hear me? <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, I just, I just gotta say, uh, well, first off about the song. I just felt like I got hit my 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 got hit by Mike Tyson a second ago. The wind got outside my truck, and the wind caught the door and swung it back and hit me right in the side of the face. Oh no! Oh, so, that's the word. I'm good right now, but uh, uh, you know, what, what I want to talk about was uh, the Texans and uh, Miss Amy. Yeah. So you know, yeah, they're in the same division. I understand that, but Miss Amy, don't let this uh, you know the vendetta you have against the Texans and this history you'll have. Don't let that, you know, make a make you make, make you make a make a bad decision on, you know, trying to uh, make make an eye for an eye against the Texans. Like y'all are in a different y'all are in a different lane than the Texans are right now. Maybe if it was last year, you know, trying to go back back and forth with them. But you got thirty other teams to worry about. Don't be trying to just, you know, keep up with the Texans. Just that one team. We got other. We got thirty more teams to worry about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a caller saying that, but yeah, I don't think she will. Uh... I think that actually the Texans made the move because of what the Titans did with Sneed. Well, it did happen mm-hmm. after the Sneed acquisition. <laughs> I just, I really wonder what, because I know you talked about him having that A-type personality and, and, you know, wanting the ball. I just want to know how that dynamic will work, especially if they decide to spread it out with all those weapons that they have in Tankdale, Nico Collins, and mm-hmm. in the backfield with Joe Mixon and Damian Pierce. Just kind of what his chemistry with that team would be. See, this is what I love because this is exactly how the coaches think. That This is perfect for me and my segue into it. He is going to change because he has better players around him and it's going to make it easier for him. See? See? So he won't be getting hot because he is the dude. Now he is not the dude. And they're telling him that coming in, you are now a piece of a championship. And once that happens, then he'll stay in his lane and he, he ain't going to be sitting there, throw me the ball. Because guess what? <laughs> They're winning. See? That, that's what people get confused of. Oh, he's going to still say he wants the ball. No, we have three other, four other guys. Guess what? Some of y'all go down. Guess what? We ain't going to be pressed. So you, you come into our culture, want to be winning, or do you want to be a loser? Ooh. Uh-huh. And that's the conversation you have with them up front. Uh huh, and then you will have no problem. See, that's what people get scared of. That exact thing. I, I think it's easy, like wheezy, easy, with the right coach. Right. Mm hmm. Not, not the right coach. Like, uh, I don't think that'd be good with Vrabel. I think it would be great with Andy <laughs> Reid. See that? Well, that's when, the first person. I right. When of. Kelsey went over there and chewed him out and bumped him. Yeah. I said, oh, yeah. Andy Reid, that he like, he probably liked it. Mm. He probably said, man, you know what? You got me back right. I am going to get you the ball. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It would have been a bigger deal if that you bump Vrabel. Could you imagine? I'm just using him because that's oh, a good no. example. I mean, like how the atmosphere is different based off of who the coach is with the personality of the players. I guess D'Amico Ryan says kind of, yeah, just what, from what we saw last season, one season as head coach, I, I feel like right. he would fit kind of that. Right, he's a he's a player's coach. Yeah. And all the guys know him. He, you know, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't see it. That's not to say that Diggs won't have an issue at some point in time, but he's going to have other people around him like, hey, man, don't worry about that. We're going to get you the ball. You know, we we winning, so let's, let's keep it rolling. And he got to stay in his lane. If he don't, I think they say, hey, man, come stand right here on the sideline next to me. See, that's what you do to a dude like that. Yeah. And you see, stand right here next to me. I'm going to put you in when we're ready. When you're ready to calm yourself down. Mm-hmm. That, you got to check them. See? You, don't, you don't run from them. You say, nah, we had this discussion before and we got you. This is how it's going to roll. Mm-hmm. And see, what happens is you build that trust and that relationship. 
That's the key that most coaches don't get at any level. Will happen. We're gonna see how it goes because they sure got digs. <laughs> mm-hmm. They got and, a bunch and, of guys, and you get all what comes with them. Yeah, you, you do. know that when they traded them. Yep. They, I mean, he's not gonna change. Yeah. Well, that was a great question, though. Great we'll get question. To, uh, for sure. We'll get to see it uh, in real time twice next year for sure. Uh, all right, digs to the Texans. Big story today. Three HL will have that and everything else that happens for the rest of the day. But uh, for us, we got to get out of here. So in the meantime, in between time. Peace.